So part of part of the I think the challenge of keeping track of all of this is kind of some geographic differences, differences in response. So so if we take South Korea, and we talked about this last time of how South Korea's response was was you know about as good as it can get, I guess. Um, and I I, I, shoot, I don't know if you still think that, but it you know it it, it it's obviously in terms of outcome has had really positive outcome. But then why is it that it hasn't come back stronger given that they haven't really had as much social distancing, no travel restrictions as far as I know really in South Korea? Why haven't they, why don't we see this as a constant kind of up and down with them? They get a few cases, but it doesn't seem like it's anything dramatic. It's hard to say exactly what's going on in all those countries. We know that South Korea acted really uh, quickly, took all the right actions, exactly as if you would, were writing like a, a textbook on how to respond to an emerging infectious disease outbreak. That's what they did. And they, and they got a lot of reward for it because they didn't have that type of debt. But they, they are, I do, don't suspect that they're not going to have mild cases. It could be that, that uh, or more cases occurring. I think it could be the fact that how much travel is occurring outside of the country. Did they get all of their, their, um, their cases extinguished and there's may, maybe a small ebb and flow of, of imported cases that are coming from other places because I know international travel is down everywhere and that may be something because when you look at places like China, for example, they're, in, they're getting cases that are imported from other parts of the, the world and it may be that travel restrictions that have occurred there have kept their cases low. Um, but the overall goal in all of these places is not going to be to keep cases to zero. That's impossible. It's going to be keep cases below a level that the hospitals can handle them. And I think that's what you have to do everywhere. And that's the metric to use because that's, this is going to happen everywhere that when they open, they're going to say, oh, they've opened too early. And, and it's not just because cases go up. It's because the cases put their hospitals in problems. So you're hearing about Japan, at least I think on the island of Hokkaido, where they had to reinstitute a, a, an emergency declaration because the cases went up too quickly after they, they peeled back. So this is going to be kind of this tug of war with this, with this virus, trying to see how much we can do safely before we get into another crisis. And it may not happen in every place. It's really going to be dependent on population density and hospital capacity in each geographic area. So there's no easy answers here. Yeah, I think the numbers in uh, the new cases in Singapore, over, the numbers I saw overwhelmingly in kind of the migrant worker populations, they're in these dormitories where these migrant workers work, uh, live in very, very uh, tight, you know, living spaces. And they travel in and out of Malaysia. Most of the migrant workers are, Mal are Malay. And that's where I think it was something like 90% of all the new cases. Yeah, Singapore has a very unique outbreak and they have a very unique system where all these migrant workers in, in the dormitories that they live in are really going to be hotbeds for spread because they don't social distance as well there. And, yeah. and Singapore is interesting because it was a case where they didn't close schools. And I think um, that's an example lots of us are using when we're trying to argue for opening schools back up in the United States. So speaking about a place that didn't close schools, what is your sense of what is happening in Sweden, if what we can learn from it and whether, you know, because you read, you know, it, it's horrible how politicized, right? Everything has come. So, so some, some news outlets are all for Sweden and anything they do is fantastic. <laughs> Other news outlets, it's, you know, Sweden is the devil and everything they do is horrific. So what's your sense of, of, of how Sweden has done in this crisis? So we you have to expect if you allow the virus to go, that you're going to get more deaths. And that's what they have, more deaths per capita. Their, their death rate is increasing and they're getting a lot of criticism for it. It's unclear to me what their hospital capacity is and how much hospital capacity they have to spare. This is kind of, I would say, almost a societal value judgment that they made that this is the way that they were going to do this. Most of their deaths have been in nursing home patients. And I know that some of these Scandinavian countries are much different about end of life care than, than places like the United States, for example. So I think that this is a, maybe a philosophical difference that we're seeing underlying this. I do think they're going to get more deaths. They're gonna be criticized for that. They, they may reach her, herd immunity, but it may be a very big societal cost. And they're not completely letting everything open. Obviously, certain mass gatherings are, are banned. People are social distancing, teleworking. It's not quite nearly as, as like what we're doing in the United States. Uh, but this is something that I, I think really is, is, is explained by the underlying ph philosophical approach they took. And I don't think if we would have not done anything in New York City, those hospitals would have probably caved. It would have not, it would have been, um, uh, it would have went into crisis standards of care with rationing. So I do think that there were hotspots in the United States that if no action were taken, we would have been in a disaster, uh, a worse disaster than we, we were already in. So I, I think that this type of a solution isn't what you can do in every place. It really has to be geographically driven. And it, the, the jury is still out on exactly what happens with Sweden. And, and they are going to take a lot of criticism because they, they made that decision. And it's interesting to me that Sweden 
chose to do this and at the same time didn't do the kind of testing and kind of tracking and isolating, not, nowhere near to the extent that something somewhere like South Korea did. So they, they, you'd think that they would combine the two and, and not just leave society open, but not, invo- not engage in the testing. Yeah, so I think that's also uh, you know something to come up with criti- to criticize them because if you were going to do that, you want to make sure you can't you, you could easily spiral out of control to a point where your hospitals can't handle it, and the only way you're going to keep that down is by at least doing testing and doing isolation of of infected cases and trying to understand their contacts and and keeping track of all of that. So to do this kind of you, they kind of took the false alternative of letting the virus completely go as, as much as you could in, in, with some social distancing versus the, a Wuhan style lockdown where you basically had a police state type of tactic. Yeah. I've, I've also read somewhere that in, in Sweden's case, the, the primary deaths are, in, are obviously in the nursing homes, but also among, they've got a huge immigrant population from the Middle East, which again, don't socially distance and, you know, so very similar to Singapore and uh, who live in very confined spaces and multi-generational spaces. So they're not typical traditional Swedes who tend to socially distance almost naturally and, and don't have that. So, you know, they've got a little bit of that Singapore, you know, aspect to them where they have two kind of societies uh, in, in, in the same space. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourrunbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, yourrunbookshow. And, um, and and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to keep this uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next.